Hey everybody, good morning and welcome back to the Sunday morning service here at Commission Church. Uh, we are so glad that you joined us in worship today. Uh, if you are a regular member or if this is your first time tuning in to our church service, uh, we just want to say thank you for joining us and thank you for being a part of our church service today. Uh, it is a joy to have you here. And if this is your first time and you're looking for a church home, uh, we want to welcome you to uh, please send us a message, a uh, personal message us on Facebook or YouTube, uh, comment below, leave your email address, and we'd love to reach out to you and connect with you and give you more information about our church. Uh, once again, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, last Sunday, we started a sermon on the topic of the Pentecost, and last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday and uh, just getting an idea of what exactly the Pentecost truly means. Uh, it was eye-opening to a lot of us, and throughout the week, I got different messages from people talking about how they were researching and doing a lot more study over the week uh, about the topic and the subject of the Pentecost, and how the Old Testament was a foreshadow of what God was to bring in the New Testament through His Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, it was so beautiful to see how the Pentecost unraveled itself all the way from the Old to the New Testament and God's plan in it all. Uh, and last, like I said last Sunday, uh, what we want to do this Sunday is kind of go uh, as a continuation to what we did last Sunday. Uh, we want to continue on the topic of the Holy Spirit. Um, but this Sunday, I want to talk about a different subject. And I want to talk about 12 traits of a Spirit-filled church. Uh, we always talk about how Commission Church, we as a church, uh, we will always strive to be a Spirit-filled church. Uh, we don't say that we are a Spirit-filled church, because if we if we do say that, we've, we've achieved a spot, we've achieved a place of excellence, uh, so to speak, or perfection, so to speak, to where we say, everybody else, look at us, this is who we are and you got to be like us. But every single day we strive, every single Sunday, every single um, you know opportunity we get as a church body, we strive to be a spirit-filled church. And what we're going to do this Sunday is kind of talk about this and have a conversation about this through the scriptures and what the Bible talks to us about what a spirit-filled church looks like. All right, so join with me in this study today as we go through this uh, this study. It's going to be a good study. So uh, what I want to do is just start with a couple of quotes. Um, as I was preparing for this message today, uh, I was uh, I, I was reading through a lot of articles, going through a lot of uh, data, a lot of. Uh, um, uh, I would say books uh, that, that have the, the, the subject of the Holy Spirit mentioned in it a lot. Uh, and in a wide variety of books, some old, some new, some authors that you probably have never heard of, and some authors that you probably have. And I'll be quoting them throughout this message, so kind of pay attention. But I want to start with this. Uh, Vance Havner, um, a, a very famed evangelist of the, the 19th and 20th century, uh, says this about the Holy Spirit, and I want you to pay attention. He says this, we are seeing much today of service without the Spirit. There is an appalling ignorance of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in our great church bodies. It is not what is done for God that counts, but rather what is done by Him. The work of His Spirit through our yielded wills. Programs, propaganda, pro pep, personnel, these are not enough. There must be power, is what he says. God's work must be done by God's people in God's way. The Quakers got their name from the fact that they trembled under the, the power of the Holy Spirit. At least their faith shook them. Too many of us today are shaky about what we believe, but not shaken about what we believe. Too many people assemble at God's house who don't really believe in the power of God. Having begun in the Spirit, we live in the flesh. Never has the church had more wires stretched with less power in it. All is vain unless the Holy Spirit of the Holy One comes down. If He seized His work, many church members would never know the difference. 
like Samson, we don't realize that he is departed, but we keep shaking ourselves in prescribed calisthenetics. Uh, man, this is this is a powerful statement that Vince Havner is making over here, right? Uh, and, and this is something that I've, I've I've been you know talking about with different people about the topic of the Holy Spirit, right? The me- the mere mention of the Holy Spirit uh, sometimes sends shivers down somebody's spine. I, I talked about this last week as to how so many people have a very bad impression about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does and what the Holy Spirit is because of what the Holy Spirit is represented as by people around and by churches around, right? And, and because of that, the, the moment people hear Holy Spirit or Spirit of God, it, it, it sends shivers down somebody's spine, right? Questionable practices and emotional extremes in the name of, you know, the, the Spirit by some have caused, you know, many believers to shy away from the Holy Spirit, right? We talked about this last week. Right? When we understand the origin of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit, man, it is difficult for us to stay away from the person of the Holy Spirit. And this is important for us to understand. Right? It's the Bible expositor and uh, the, the evangelist, A.C. Dixon, uh, who, who actually says this. And I want to I quote him here. Uh, he's talking about the modern day church. And he says this, uh, when we rely on organization, we get what organization can do. When we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely on eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. But when we rely on the Holy Spirit, we get what God can do, right? This is powerful. When we begin understanding what he's trying to say, right? Understanding how God works through his plan in our lives will open our eyes into understanding him in such a deep way, right? Uh, when we study the scriptures, and when, like we did last week, man, if we study how, uh, just in the New Testament, right? Uh, how uh, Bethlehem was designed for God to be with us, right? Ca- Calvary was designed for God to be for us, right? And Pentecost is God inside of us, is God in us. It's that exp- experience um, that we're talking about, right? So Bethlehem talks about our about the incarnation where God was with us. He, he brought himself back to us, just like the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve experienced God with them through his son and the plan of his son. God brings Jesus Christ in flesh to us, right? The incarnation as we know it, right? Calvary was God for us, right? Fighting for us, for to redeem us from sin, right? Salvation, the salvation experience, And when we talk about the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the Holy Spirit in us. We're talking about sanctification, right? So the Bible has this beautiful plan that God has laid out for the work of the Holy Spirit to be inside of us. We know this very well. When Jesus left the earth, he looked at us and said, I am going. He looked at his disciples and said, I am going. But here comes the Holy Spirit who will guide you, who will lead you, who will be your comfort, who will be your strength, who will be your counselor. Look up to him in times of need. Look up to him when you need guidance and strength. When we give the Holy Spirit the importance that the Holy Spirit needs in our lives, our lives are radically changed because we allow the person of the Holy Spirit to gain control and move in and through us. In a few moments, we're going to talk about that. But what we're going to talk about today is the 12 traits of a Spirit-filled church. What are the 12 traits of a Spirit-filled church as Luke talks about it in the book of Acts chapter number 4? So last Sunday, we spoke about Acts chapter number two, where uh, the people all gathered together. And when the time had come that Jesus had talked about 40 days later, right, everyone was in the same room in one accord and the Holy Spirit fell. And the Bible says people were filled with the unction of the Holy Spirit, right? So go with me to chapter number four. This is where we're going to start our study today, right? So the 12 traits, we're going to go to chapter number four, and we'll start with verse number one, right? Chapter number four, verse number one. And this is what the Bible says. And as they were speaking to the people, and when we talk about they, the Bible is talking about Peter and John, right? And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. 
greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Verse 3, And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Verse 4, But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Now, here in chapter number 4, what we're about to see is we're about to see this exponential growth that the church is about to go through, right? We, we saw where Peter stood up and he preached and 3,000 people were saved. In a few minutes, we're going to be talking about another experience where people were being added to the church daily. Right? And we just read this passage of scripture where Peter and John are preaching right in the temple. And, and here comes the, the, the people of the law, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the, the priests and the, the temple guard come. They arrest them and say, how dare you speak? How dare you preach Jesus that rose up from the dead? And the Bible says it annoyed them greatly. Why did it annoy them? Because, man, these are people that wanted to make sure that the law was kept these were the people that made sure that religious freedom was something that they experienced, right? Here are the people that came and they're like, man, we want to make sure everything is in order. This is something that we'll have to deal with. And point number one that I want to leave with you, the first trait that I want to leave with you is this, y'all. The spirit man will always be up in arms with the religious man right? The trait number one that we're going to see in a spirit-filled church is that a spirit-filled church will always be up against persecution. Persecution knocks on the door of every spirit-filled church. If you are a church that is spirit-filled, remember, you're going to face persecution in some way or the other. As we strive to be a spirit-filled church, you and I need to understand something. We are going to see persecution in different ways. I don't know how. We've not seen crazy persecution as yet, but a spirit-filled church will be assured that, man, people are not going to like it. A spirit man will, the spirit man will always be up in arms with a religious man, right? A church that walks in the spirit will always wage war with the religious anarchists of our times. Right? There are always going to be people that look at us, that will look at the spiritual church and say, oh, this is wrong, or that is wrong, or this is not something that you have to do, or that's not something that, that's the, the Bible doesn't say that, or this or that, or this is how we have always done it. Peter and John were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees are coming in. I mean, the priests, we know who the priests are, the, the captain of the temple, the, the person that was there to maintain law and order was there. And also the Sadducees. Who are the Sadducees? Sadducees were this religious faction that wielded societal power in nearly every aspect of that culture back in the day. They were men that hated Jesus. And they were Jewish aristocrats of their day. They were known for much for their, they were known for their, 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 their wealth, their corruption, and their religious devotion. They had all of these going together, right? They were, they were the people that made sure that, you know, they got on people's cases if something was wrong, if something went wrong. They were the first ones that made sure that they, their presence was felt. What the disciples were up against were a group of people that were religious. There were a group of people that wanted to look at them and say, no, we don't care who you are. We don't care who you're trying to follow, who you're trying to preach, but this is the way we do things. And if you don't do it this way, you're wrong. Right? They were there. They, were, they, they came with an intention to tear them down, to bring them down. And that's exactly what they were going to do. Right? The Bible says they were annoyed. That's what the Bible says. They were annoyed with the truth. What were they annoyed with? That they were preaching the resurrection from dead. They were preaching that Jesus was... That was the truth. They were annoyed with the truth. The Sanhedrin, the, the temple of back in the day, they, the, 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 the temple, the, the group of people that ran the temple was permitted to rule only because the Romans allowed them to rule. If you guys have been watching the Chosen, the series Chosen, uh, man, it's a beautiful series. If you haven't watched it, I suggest you watch it. Season one just got done, and it's a beautiful series about the life of Jesus, right? Uh, we, we know how, uh, you know, the Sanhedrin was in control because the Roman Empire gave them the ability to, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and the Sanhedrin was permitted to rule only because the Romans allowed them to, right? And because of the apostles' teachings and because the disciples were preaching this, they were afraid that they might lose control over the people, right? And the people would drift away, that they would not have a following, right? The Romans were likely to take control. They were annoyed that someone would jeopardize their freedom of worship, 
right? A spirit-filled church is a nuisance and an annoyance to the enemy. You got to understand that. If you want to annoy the enemy, you better catch up with the Holy Spirit. The spirit-filled church is always going to be a threat to the enemy because the enemy wants to do things a certain way and nothing more. He doesn't want, to, want you to, to, to experience revelation. He doesn't want you to experience freedom. The, the, the enemy does not want you to have deeper insight of God. And when the, when the disciples and the apostles were trying to preach the truth, here are people that were annoyed, is what the Bible says. Remember, a spirit-filled church will annoy the enemy. That's a sign of a spirit-filled church. If we are a spirit-filled church, we got to get on the nerves of the enemy. That's something that I want to remind us uh, today, right? And that's something that was a part of the, the spirit-filled church. The spirit-filled church was, was getting on the nerves of the enemy. They were, they were criticized for it. They were ostracized for it. They were persecuted for it. I want, to, I want to let you know this morning, we're probably going to be persecuted and ostracized for our faith and what we believe in and how we, how we believe in what we believe in. But in the middle of all of that, God looks at us and says, you stand strong in the faith because I will bring you through it, right? The Holy Spirit gives us that ability. I want you to jump to verse 18. So I'm going to skip that passage of scripture where they're arrested and taken and all of that. But we're going to go back to what the traits of a spirit-filled church are, right? So let's go to verse number 18, right? Here's what the Bible says. And when they had summoned them, who's them again, Peter and John, right? They commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen or heard. Trait number two of a spirit-filled church. They will always talk about Jesus, right? You know, no matter what, no matter if they're told to stop talking about him, no matter if they're threatened, no matter if their life is on the line, no matter if they're politically wrong, it doesn't matter, right? A spirit-filled church will always find reasons to put Jesus at the center of it all, right? Now listen to this scripture. They were threatened is what the Bible says. They were given an ultimatum. They were told, hey, you need to stop. The threats were flaring at them, right? And this is what I want, I want us to understand this morning. The sign and the mark of a spirit-filled church is that its leaders and members will always talk about Jesus no matter what. Right? Why couldn't they stop speaking? Because they were filled with the Spirit of God. When you are filled with the Spirit of God, right, you are prone to bear fruit. And what is a fruit? That man, you can't stop but telling people about Jesus. When you know the power of what the God has done in your life, you can't help but keep it to, you, to, to yourself. You, you can't help but share it with other people. You can't just keep it to yourself. You can't help but let other people know about how good this God is. That's the fruit of the Spirit, man. How could we stop telling people? John chapter 15 and verse 16 actually says this. It says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that, that you, should, you should go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Right? This is powerful. The early disciples had no hesitancy in realizing that they were involved in something way over their heads, y'all. And this is the powerful thing that I want to leave with you guys. They were smart enough to realize that their battle really wasn't against the Sanhedrin or the priests or the Sadducees or even other, against other human beings, but to take a stand for Christ and the truth of the gospel made them a target of the evil one. They knew that they were, they were no match for, 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 for Satan and his schemes. They were unashamedly dependent on God at every turn that they got down on their knees. So what, what is the third trait that we're going to be talking about, right? So, so here's, here's what the Bible says. And when they heard this, Acts chapter 4, verse 24, right? Uh, and when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Heard, heard what? Right? They basically had to make a decision. Man, you, you cannot preach about Jesus is what they were told. They said, but they, as far as they're concerned, they're like, man, 
It's going to be all about Jesus. If you ask me, it's going to be all about Jesus was their focal point. They were going to make sure that everybody heard about Jesus because they just saw Jesus die. He was crucified and he rose up once again, appearing to people over those 40. Come on, somebody. And they were basically standing there and saying, no matter what you tell us, we have seen with our eyes. How are you going to tell us that this is not going to work? Right? So what did they do when they were persecuted? The sign of a spirit-filled church, the sign number three, trait number three is this, right? And it acts up to four in verse 24. It says, when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Trait number three, they will pray together. The battle that they were going through drove them to their knees. How many of us choose to go on our knees as a first resort? There are so many of us, when we try to face battles, man, we want to do everything in our capacity, and then we go to prayer at the, at the last, as a last resort, right? Their response to the battle they faced was this. They prayed. We must learn to pray as if our lives and our ministries dependent on it, because, because they do. That's what I want us to understand. I want our church to understand that, man, we are in a battleground. Spiritual warfare is all around us. You notice that when they began to pray, they focused on praise rather than pity. They weren't telling God, God, this is what I meant. Man, we're preaching about the gospel. We're preaching about Jesus, but we're being ostracized. Oh, God, pity. No, 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 no. Their focus was not on themselves. It was on Christ they worshipped. That was what their focus was on. They knew that they were in a war. They knew that they were not warring against flesh and blood. Man, church, I want to remind you as a spirit-filled church, we're always going to be in a war. It's worse than a war. It's, sometimes it's going to be worse than, you know, the wars that you think that, 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 that we're facing, right? There's this big connection between prayer and war. Sometimes when I say, man, we're a spiritual battle and spiritual war, you think about the small things here and there, people falling sick or, or this. No, 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 it's bigger than that. Are you and I going to look at everything that we face as spiritual warfare, right? There's this big connection between prayer and war. When, when, when you and I view life as war, your perspective on prayer and its impact on life will dramatically change. You know, Ephesians 6 actually says this. If you go to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says this, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition, right? Prayer. What is he saying? He says, man, he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of Spirit, which is the Word of God, and verse 18, it doesn't stop there. It's not a new sentence. It's a continuation. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times. He says, take the, the weapons of warfare, right? It's important, right? Take the helmet, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But then don't remember this. Prayer is the power that wields the weapon. Take the weapons up in prayer is what Paul says. Actually, John 15 and 16 confirms this to us. And he says this, You did not, Jesus says this, You did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you that you may go and bear fruit and that, and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, uh, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This is powerful. It's important for us to understand this principle. Why is the Father going to answer prayers in Jesus' name? Because Jesus has given us a mission, a mandate to go and bear fruit. It's John Piper that says, man, prayer malfunctions at the hands of the believer because we don't treat it like war. Right? He goes on to say that we it malfunctions because we don't treat it like a, a wartime walkie-talkie. Instead, we treat it like a domestic intercom where we can call. Are you understanding this? Until we believe that life is war, we will not know what prayer is for. Go with me to the next verse. In verse number 24, the Bible continues and says this. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. Don't miss this church. A spirit-filled church is a unified church. A spirit-filled church is a church that stands together in the midst of adversity and overcomes through prayer and supplication. 
I'm asking us today, are we a unified church, a church that can stand together and pray together and intercede together and ask God for a breakthrough and a deliverance? We are in the, we're, we're approaching a big harvest season. We're praying for a permanent location. And I pray that each one of us will come together and we will pray together that God will give us the very best as we get into this new season of our ministry ahead of us. As a church, as a ministry, as a, as a church family, let's intercede together. Let's stand united in prayer in this season. Jump, jump to verse 29 with me real quick. And this is what the Bible says, right? And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bond servants may speak thy word with all confidence. I, I want us to understand this passage, guys, right? Uh, the, 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 the Bible is very clear in this, that Paul and uh, Peter and John have taken this to the Lord, right? Point number four, the sign of a spirit-filled church is that they will refuse to war with the flesh. It's so important for us to understand this. David Platt, actually, in his book, Rad in his book Radical, has this, has this chapter entitled The Beginning of an End of Ourselves, right? And he says this in that book. He says this uh, in the subsection titled Dependent on Ourselves or Desperate for His Spirit. He says this, this is where I am most convinced as a pastor. I am part of a system that has created a whole host of means and methods, plans and strategies for doing church that require little, if any, power from God. I am frightened by the reality that the church I lead can carry on most of our activities, never realizing that the Holy Spirit of God is virtually absent from the picture. How many of us are guilty of this? How many of our churches around are guilty of this? The Bible says as, as soon as they were faced with opposition, you know what they did? They looked at the Lord and says, and now Lord, take note of their threats. They directed the opposition. They directed the persecution to God so that God can fight that battle. It was not their battle to fight. How many of us depend on our own, own abilities? I, I spoke about this earlier, right? I spoke about this in detail earlier. Romans chapter 8 and, verse eight, 8 and verse 13 talks about this, right? It says, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the flesh. When you and I walk in the Spirit, you have the ability to look at the flesh and say, no, not today. A Spirit-filled church has the ability to look at the flesh and say, we will not war according to the flesh. If there are forces of the flesh coming against the Spirit-filled church, you are going to fight it with the Spirit of God. You are going to fight it by diverting it to God. Faithful servant of God. Spirit-filled servant of God that's listening to me. The, if you are listening to the, you know, my message this morning, this is all I want to tell you. When you are faced with opposition and, and crazy situations, don't fight them on your own. Galatians 5.17, Paul reminds us again, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There are so many things in this world that is, that, that, that is drawing you to it, that's making you lust after it. And in the middle of all of that, the Spirit-filled believer and the Spirit-filled church will stand its ground and say, this is not my battle to fight. Lord, you take threats very seriously. Can you take this in your hands? Right? And this is where we go to verse, uh, the point number five. Point number four is they will refuse to war with the flesh. A spiritual church will refuse to war with the flesh. We will not war with the flesh. Point number five in Acts chapter four and verse 29, the Bible says this, and now Lord, take note of their threats. And he continues to say, and grant that thy bond servants may speak thy word with all confidence. With all confidence. Point number five, a spirit-filled church will pray for boldness. When people come together and pray for it, boldness will happen, right? When people often ask me, how do we pray for boldness? Pray for it, right? People were astonished by Peter and John's boldness. That's what the Bible says. But you know what Peter said? But you, you know what Paul says? He says, pray for me. Right? That I might preach this word with boldness. That's what Paul says. 
right? Paul, Paul actually says to Timothy, he says, this is, you know, this is not the spirit that was given to you, right? What was given to you was a spirit of boldness. I don't know what it is that is operating in you right now, but that's, this is not what God gave you, right? It's not about giving people, you know, uh, you know pep talks and, and telling people that, you know, that, that they're thinking too much into it. When people come up to you, I, I always deal with this. When people come up to me and say, oh, pastor, I don't think I'm bold. I have this tendency of actually looking at them and saying, oh, no, no, no. I think you're thinking too much into it. God has made you bold. You have this boldness inside of you. You're inherently bold. There's this tendency for us to pep talk people, to encourage people, to give them the go ahead. Right? But what do we, you know what we don't do is actually look at people and be honest with them. Be honest with people and say, maybe you're not bold enough. Let's pray for that. Right? Maybe you're struggling with boldness. Let's pray together. Right? We are quick to comfort people. Right? But we're not quick to pray for them. That's what I want to challenge you with today. What did the disciples do? Man, they, they, they prayed about boldness. Right? The word, the, the word of use of there is confidence. Boldness is what the Bible says. Right? Do you, do you ask people to pray for you? Do you ask people to intercede for you? Is there something that you can't do? Is there this boldness that you lack? God is looking at some of us and saying, man, I want to give you this boldness, but pray for this boldness. When is the last time you asked someone to pray for you? Right? Pray for boldness to come upon you. And then we wonder why, you know, you know we're so insecure or why am I so afraid? Why do I? That's because you, you, you haven't prayed about it. You haven't asked people to intercede and pray with you about it. The fifth point is this. I want to leave you with this. Is they will pray for boldness. A spirit-filled church will always pray for boldness. How do you get boldness to, to preach? How do you get boldness to share the gospel with somebody? How do you get the boldness to stand in the gap and, 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 and preach to, to people without hesitation it's when the holy spirit gives you that boldness inside of you and the boldness cannot come unless you and i get into the presence of god and pray for boldness the, the bible says the church got together everyone got together and they started praying for boldness and confidence because they were up against a big big power in the sanhedrin and they knew in order for them to present the truth they needed boldness that's what the bible says they were surprised the people in the temple were like, whoa, these were nobodies yesterday and now they have all these guts. They have, they have all this, you know, this, this courage and determination. Where did that come from? They only know that it came through prayer. And when they went to their knees and asked God for strength, God filled them with boldness in their heart. Go to verse number 30. Let's step to the next point. While you stretch out your hands to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So it continues from verse number 29, right? Where in verse number 29 it says, And grant thy bond servants may speak the word with confidence, right? While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of the holy servant, Jesus. Now here's the, 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 the sixth point that I want to leave with you. A spiritful church will pray for healings, signs, and wonders. So many of us believe in healing, but man, we don't pray for healing. As far as it concerns me, man, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not praying. I'm looking for the doctor. I'm looking for a second opinion. I'm looking. It's, it's easy when it's somebody else's life, right? Oh, why are they not praying? Or let me pray. But have you noticed that when it's your own life, prayer is often the last thing that you resort to? A lot of us stay open for options. What are my options? Healing is better when it's someone else's issue or someone else's need, right? But when I'm concerned, when, when it's my own life, when it's my own uh, spiritual warfare that we're talking about, man, I'm, I'm guilty of that. Sometimes when we're going through something as a family, man, you know, yeah, we do pray most of the time, but there are some times that we try to tackle it with our own wisdom, with our own understanding. We want to know what Mayo Clinic has to say or why, what Google has to say before we ask God what He has to say, right? It's so important. As a Spirit-filled church, we as a church will persevere and we will pray for healing. If there's somebody that's sick in their bodies, yes, we will pray for the will of God, but in, before that, we will pray for healing. We will believe for signs and wonders because that's what the early church did. A Spirit-filled church was a church that looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, by your name, 
Signs, wonders, and miracles will happen. As a church, Commission Church, I want to challenge you. Let our first option always be prayer, that we will pray. When we hear people that are sick, we will pray for them, and they will be healed in the name of Jesus. I pray for faith inside of us that no matter what the problem is, no matter what the sickness is, we will have a group of people within our church that will stand up in faith and not say, not the first words are not, you know, uh, oh, sad for them or bad for them or, uh, oh, that, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened. No, but in faith, rise up and say, we're going to pray through this. No matter what happens, the will of God will eventually happen, but we're going to pray through this. We're going to believe for a miracle. We're going to believe for signs. We're going to believe for wonders, right? A spirit-filled church does that. Go down to verse number 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. A spirit-filled church, point number seven, write it down. They will be open to the continuing infilling of the Spirit. That's what a spirit-filled church will do. They will not be content with the, uh, I experienced this sometime in my life, and, uh, you know, like five years ago. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm happy. That content feeling is not, never going to be there for a spirit-filled church. They will always persevere and they will say, this is not a one-time experience. I want to continue. So remember, in chapter number two, they had experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And this was again, man, as they prayed, as they interceded, as they spent time in the presence of God, what starts happening? It says this, right? And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken and they were all filled. So everyone else that were not filled with the Holy Spirit on that day, man, they began getting filled. So we see how the Spirit filling, a lot of people argue and say, oh yeah, that was just a one-time experience that the people went through, you know, in the upper room. That would never happen again. No, 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 no. It did happen again. It's an ongoing thing. It's a progressive infilling of the Holy Spirit. Never be content. As a spiritual church, we will always aim and that we, we will always go to that point where we will be like, God, we want, we want to strive and we want to go to that point where we will not be content with what you did yesterday. We want to see bigger things tomorrow. Right? Do not be content, church. Do not be content. Right. Verse number 31, uh, this is what the Bible says. Uh, and they were all filled with the Spirit, continuing there. They continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. So they prayed for boldness. That was the earlier point that we talked about. And, and, and point number eight, the eighth trait of a spirit-filled church is they will walk in holy boldness. They will walk in holy boldness. The Bible says, then they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. In the middle of all the persecution, in the middle of all the uncertainty, in the middle of all the negativity, they, they said, you know what? We're going to walk in boldness. We're going to talk in boldness. We're going to continue sharing the gospel in boldness. Oh, you're going to get killed. You're going to get locked up. We don't care. We have boldness inside of us. They were, not, they were not hesitant to put their lives on the line to see God's word and the name of Jesus being spread. How does one walk in boldness? Right? A lot of people ask me, how can I walk in boldness, Pastor Ashish? The first thing is this. Refuse to live in fear. Refuse to live in fear. Fear is this epidemic in our society. Right? The Bible instructs, in, instructs us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. What does it say? It says this, to live, we have to live by faith right, and not draw back in fear. That's what the Bible says. Right? Uh, the second way in which you can walk in boldness is by putting setbacks behind you. The things that have caused you to stumble behind you. You're not a failure because you try new things and, and they didn't work out. Man, you, you fail only when you stop trying. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. If you do, recover quickly. Press on. Sometimes the things that have put us down, the things that have disappointed us, the failures of yesterday have this ability to look at you and me and say, no, you're not going to go anywhere in life. Man, boldness goes away. Confidence goes away when you fail, when you, when you, when you step down, when, when there are things that happen to you negatively. You have this ability, this tendency to, to kind of go back into your shell. But God looks at you and says, put setbacks behind you. Right? The third thing is this, do not draw comparisons, right? Boldness will be impossible as long as you compare yourself to others. Boldness comes from accepting who you are and being the best you can be. You cannot be a Paul. You cannot be a John. You cannot be a Peter. But you can be the best you ever 
right? And that's what I want to encourage you with today. The fourth point is this. Be willing to take action. Search your heart and ask yourself what you believe God wants you to do and then take a step of faith and actually do it, right? Boldness requires you to take an action. Take a step of faith. Right? Not just leave the past behind. Not just don't compare yourself to other people. But man, your battle is not somebody else's battle. Your battle is unique. And the only way you can walk in boldness is when you can put your inhibitions aside and trust God that He has the best in store for you. Continuing to verse number 32. Right, This is what the Bible says. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. We talked about unity, right? A spirit-filled church, point number nine, a spirit, the trait of a spirit-filled church is that we will be unified in heart and in soul, right? Um, so important to understand this. I don't want to elucidate further because I've already talked about this, but unity not just comes in prayer, but unity in all things. Are we unified in our vision? Are we unified in the things that God asks us to do, in our missional uh, endeavors, in the things that God... We, I thank God for an amazing, united uh, board of elders that we have in our church. I thank God for each one of them, each one of them that have hearts that can stand by the vision that God has given me as a pastor and say, Pastor, you know what? We know that we're a missional church and we want to make a global impact in all the parts of the world that you're sending us to. Right, uh, the, 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 the ability that we have to reach the nations of the world all across America, the people that we reach in America is because of the dedication of each and every person on our team, in our church, that selflessly gives your time, that believes in the vision, that stands united. That's a sign of a, uh, of a spirit-filled church. A spiritual church will be unified in heart and in soul. When somebody's hurting, you are hurting. When somebody is going through pain, you are going through pain. Let, I pray that this, this closeness and this unity that we have will be something that we will be known for no matter how big we get. Right? And the, and the, chapter, the, the chapter continues in verse number 32, the second part of uh, verse number 32. It says this, and no, and no one said that, uh, okay, Let's, let's track back verse number 32, the second part. And no one said that any of, these, any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. You know what a sign of a spiritual church is, a trait of a spiritual church, is that they will be generous. They're a generous church right? Uh, you know how it stimulates generosity? The moment the Holy Spirit comes, man, everyone said, we don't care what we have. God is bigger than, and than what we have, right? They, they were willing to share their possessions. They were willing to share their time. They were willing to share their homes, their resources, their tables. They were, they were willing to share meals. They were willing to bring people in and allow them to stay in their homes. They were generous, man. The, a sign of a Holy Spirit, church, a Holy Spirit led church is that we will be generous in everything we'll do. We will not hold back. We will not give in to stinginess. When we give, we will open up our hearts and we will give the same way God gives us. Right? And that's something that we are known for as a church. And we will continue striving for that. We will continue being a spirit filled church. And verse number 33 goes on to say this. And with great power, right? With great power is what the Bible says. Great power. The apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the abundant grace was upon them, upon them all. I'm going to break that verse in a few, in, in a few points, in, in point number 11 and 12. But here is, is trait number 11, right? With great power, they will experience His power. The word power is His word dynamis to proclaim the gospel, right? Uh, point number 11 that I want to leave with us this morning is this. Uh, we will be a church, a spirit-filled church will be a church that will experience His dynamis, His power to proclaim the gospel. No, it's just not power. But the Bible says it's great power, 
right? God's answer reminds us of Ephesians 3 verse 20, where Paul actually reminds us that he is able to see, right, right, God doing exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that he can ask or think according to his power. What power? Not this impersonal power, but a power that, 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 that God provides, right? It's this, this power providing person in the, in the form of the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit that energizes us, that lifts us up, that is within us. That's what I want to ask you today. Do we believe in that power? The power that is to change, the power that can transform us. It's Francis Chan that talks about this and he says this in his, in his book, Forgotten God. He talks about this and he says, God put his spirit in us so we could be known for our power. Sadly, most believers in churches are known for talent and intellect rather than supernatural power. What's worse is that we're okay with it. I'm willing to bet there are millions of churchgoers across America who cannot confidently say that they have experienced his presence or action in their lives over the past year, and many of them believe, uh, and many of them do not believe that they can. That's sad. Do you know that Jesus could feel the dunamis when it left his body? Yeah, dunamis, the power. It left his body, and Jesus knew immediately, right? How did he know? Right? The Bible talks about uh, in Luke chapter 8, the woman with the issue of, the blood, of blood. She was determined to press through, walk through the crowd, and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. But before she could do that, she had to make this faith decision. If, that, if she would if she'd be able to reach out to Jesus, he would cause her to make her, he would cause to make her whole, right? She had to make that decision. And between her and Jesus were these many people in the way. And she had to press through the crowd, get them out of the way, and reach out and touch Jesus. And she did. And you know what the Bible says? She was healed. And you know what the Bible says? The moment she touched Jesus, the Bible says Jesus turned around and says, Who touched me? And the disciples mocked him and said, Jesus, there are so many people around you. There are so many people thronging you and touching you all over the place. What do you mean, who touched me? And Jesus said, No, 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 no. Don't fool me. I know exactly what happened. Because the moment that person touched me, power, dunamis, went out of me. Remember that power goes out of Jesus and power is something that Jesus gives to us and to his church, to his children, right? What stops us from releasing that dynamis from Jesus? What stops, you know, that, that, that dynamis from being released from Jesus to us? People, that's what, Right? Uh, that's what the woman was struggling. That's what the woman was kind of navigating through. What stops us from releasing the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit out of, our, out of our lives to impact and heal other people? The fear of man. What others might say. What the Sadducees might say. What the, what the people of truth or what the people of the law or what people that, that think they're in the right will say about this. Right? People are often what cause the Holy Spirit not to work the way the Holy Spirit should work. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 19, the Bible says the whole multitude, right? That's what the Bible says. And the whole multitude, um, give me a second, uh, the whole multitude sought to touch him and there went dynamis out of him, power out of him, and healed them all is what the Bible says. Here's another translation. Everyone was trying to touch him for when they did, healing power went out from him and they were cured, is what the Bible says, right? Jesus delegated dynamis. He gave that power to his disciples. He gives that power to you and to me, right? In Luke chapter 9 and verse 1, the Bible talks about that. He now called the twelve together and gave them power, dynamis, and authority to overcome all the devils and to cure e diseases and send them to proclaim the kingdom of God to heal. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, the Bible says, And now you see that I have given you power. The word power over there is the word dynamis, to tread underfoot snakes and scorpions and all the forces of the enemy, and nothing will ever harm you, is what the Bible says. 
So are you and I a church that experiences the dynamics, the power of God? Are our Sunday services filled with the power of God? Are our worship services filled with the power of God? When the worship team leads worship, is the power of God being manifested? As the, as the pastor preaches the word, is the power being manifested to where it is touching somebody? To a woman that is reaching out, to somebody that's reaching out through the screen right now, is the power of God going out and touching somebody? A spirit-filled church will not just be a church that receives the dynamis, a spirit-filled church will be a church that releases the dynamis of Jesus Christ as well. Brings me to the last point, verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Uh, a spirit-filled church will be a church that will receive grace. What does that mean? It simply means this. A spirit-filled church will always have the favor of God that will follow them in everything that they do. How many of us want to receive favor? How many of us want to walk in favor? How many of us want to walk in the grace of Jesus Christ? The only way you and I can walk in favor, you remember Psalms 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me, that favor will follow me all the days of my life. The only way that can happen is when you and I walk in the Spirit of God. There it is, a Spirit-filled church, straight out of Acts chapter 4. If you have to summarize what we observed about a spirit-filled body of believers, this is what I would say, y'all. Before the Pentecost, the disciples were like rabbits, right? After the Pentecost, they were like ferrets, right? Peter the denier, right? You remember Peter the denier? Empowered and emboldened by the Spirit, was supernaturally transformed into Peter the proclaimer, Right? He, he just stood up and he started preaching. And the moment he started preaching, people were saved. People were being baptized. So much of power. So much of the anointing fills up Peter. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit is what the Bible says. Man, before the Pentecost, the disciples found it hard to do easy things. But after the Pentecost, when the Spirit of the Lord had come upon them, they found it easy to do hard things. It's A.W. Tozer who says this, right, 50-something years ago, he, he made a similar pro pronouncement. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church in Acts, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Powerful, powerful statement, y'all. And this is my challenge to us today. This is my challenge. Which 95% would you want our church to be like? Would you like to be like the 95% of today that if something happened and the Holy Spirit was to leave, we wouldn't even notice that we would go on with our programs that we would go on with our agendas and we would go on with our structures? Or would we be like that, old, that New Testament church? When they experienced the Holy Spirit, they would drastically, uh, completely change when they started walking in the Spirit. I wonder what 95% we will be a part of. I pray that we will be a 95% like the New Testament church that walked in the Spirit of God, and because they walked in the Spirit of God, man, these 12 traits were something that stuck with them, and they made sure that it followed them in everything that they did. I want to urge you, I want to encourage you this morning, church. If you're listening to me, I want to encourage you. I pray that we will strive to be a Spirit-filled church in everything that we do. I pray that we will press onward that we will not negotiate with the devil, that we will not give in to the schemes of the enemy, that we will press onward, that we will press forward, and we will see the victory of God in a supernatural way in these coming days. I thank God for each one of you. Can I pray for you this morning? Father, we just thank you for this moment. Thank you for this word. I pray, God, that this word will come alive in our hearts. And I pray, God, that as we uh, study this word through this week, these 12 points, I pray that, they will, that we will reflect on these 12 points, that we will stand in boldness, 
that we will proclaim in boldness that, God, you alone are king over our lives. Father, I speak boldness upon each and every person in our church. I pray that we will be unified in the spirit, God, that we will pray without ceasing, that in everything that we do, we will put Jesus at the center of it all. Thank you, God, for that determination that you give us. Thank you, Abba, Father. I pray that we want to be a spirit-filled church that believes in signs, wonders, miracles, God. I pray, God, that we will be a church that has faith, that we will be a church that is unified in spirit and in soul. Thank you, Abba, Father. That we will be a church that, that will not try to fight the flesh on our own, that we will be a church that will always look up to you and allow you to fight the battles that only you can win, God. So, Lord, would you encourage us, would you strengthen us today? I pray, God, that we will be a church that will experience abundance of grace, God. I pray, God, that we will be a church, a spiritual church that will operate in dynamis, God. I pray, God, that that will be upon us. That we will be a church that will not forget what it is to be a church of power. Thank you for this word today. Thank you for challenging us. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thank God for this word, and I pray that it was an encouragement to you guys. Once again, thank you guys for joining us in service today. Uh, I want to I want to especially give a big shout out to Blessin. Uh, he graduated. Uh, 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 he's going to graduate on Saturday, uh, and I pray that God will uh, actually be with him, strengthen him in his next journey in his life as he goes on to college. I pray that God will strengthen him, and I pray that God's strength will be upon him and surround him uh, in these coming days. Bless and God bless you. I love you, my brother. Uh, I pray that God's richest blessings will follow you. Uh, God bless each one of you. Thank you again for tuning in. Uh, I hope you have a blessed, wonderful, great, amazing Sunday with family and friends. And I pray and I hope that we get to see each other soon. No update as yet on our venue availability. As and when we hear from our venue, we will be giving you an update. But as of now, we are making arrangements to see how we can uh, see if we can start meeting in an informal setting uh, before we actually go into in-person services. Of course, that will come with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, stipulations and a lot of things, guidelines that we'll have to put down that our team is working hard on right now. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the process of acquiring hand sanitizer and uh, we're in the process of acquiring masks and a lot of these things to make sure that our venue is safe and clean uh, to welcome you guys back in uh, as we start our services, in-person services once again. I can't wait for that to happen and I can't wait to see what God is going to do this year. All right, God bless you. Stay in touch with us. Uh, stay up to date. Uh, stay in tune with us on social media, all our updates. Uh, uh, so on and so forth. So thank you so much for tuning in again. God bless you. I will see you soon. What a beautiful service. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to share your notes with us using our socials at The Commission Church. And remember, Encounter Bible Study is this Thursday on Facebook Live. See you soon.